Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, if you're um, filling out the attendance form, just go ahead and get that done quickly. Um, so um, <clears throat> today we are starting a new unit. Um, and this unit deals with forces and Newton's three laws of motion. Uh, remember, in the previous unit, we introduced motion and we basically talked about ways um, by which we describe motion mathematically. So um, using math, using graphs, using all those things to be able to give some sort of descriptor to motion. Um, this unit mainly deals with the causes of motion. Um, and just making sense of the empirical laws that we see all around us. So I'm going to begin by sharing my screen so you guys can see this PowerPoint that I have posted. Okay. Um, so again, this unit deals with forces and Newton's three laws of motion. Um, before we get into the details of Newton's three laws, I want to talk about um, an important force that you guys are going to see throughout this year. Um, and that is the force of gravity. Everyone in here um, is familiar with the force of gravity. You know that if you have some object, let's say some object like a basketball or something, and it's on top of a building and you take that object and you release it, you obviously know that ball is going to accelerate downward. It's going to accelerate downward because there's a force, there's an invisible force, which we call gravity, that pulls it to the earth. Now, um, it turns out all objects that are accelerating to the Earth as a result of being in a gravitational field experiences a certain magnitude to its acceleration. And I'm going to write that out here. Okay. Now here's an important number that I need for you guys to remember that you guys are going to see throughout this course, especially throughout this unit. And that number is the acceleration of gravity. So the acceleration of gravity, scientists have calculated to be 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay. This is a very, very, very important number that you guys need to remember. Um, um, it appears all the time in physics. Um, we use it a lot in various calculations. Um, and this, this number represents the acceleration of gravity for any object falling toward the Earth. Um, so what does this number mean? When I say that an object falling toward the Earth has an acceleration of negative 9.8 meters per second squared, what does that mean? So remember, guys, what a constant acceleration means. We talked about this before. What this means is, is that for every second the ball is in the air, it increases its velocity by 9.8 meters per second. So, for instance, let me um, 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 let me give you an example of how this works. I'm gonna I'm gonna take that number 9.8 and I'm gonna round it off to 10, just to make my calculations easy. Um, so, if I take this number and round this off to 10, so guys, if we assume that the acceleration of gravity is negative 10 meters per second squared. Basically, what that means is if the ball is falling after the first second that it's in the air, it has an instantaneous velocity of 10 meters per second. If it keeps falling after the second second it's in the air, it has an instantaneous velocity of 20 meters per second. And if it, as it keeps going after the third second that's in the air, it has an instantaneous velocity of 30 meters per second. So guys, notice the trend. Notice our velocity is increasing by 10 meters per second every second. So guys, what would be the instantaneous velocity at four seconds? Anyone want to type that in the chat? So it'll be 40 meters per second. What about the instantaneous velocity of the ball after being in the air for five seconds? It would be 50 meters per second. Okay. So hopefully you guys should get the idea. Basically, uh, what we're saying here is that for every second the ball is in the air, 
Okay, assuming its acceleration is 10 meters per second squared, what that means is for every second, the velocity increases by 10 meters per second. So the third second, the velocity of ball is 30 meters per second, then 40 meters per second, then 50 meters per second, and so on, however long it's in the air. So that's what we mean when we say um, objects falling toward the Earth have a constant acceleration of somewhere around 10 meters per second squared. Again, to be exact, scientists know that the acceleration of gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. That's an important number that we will see over and over and over and again within this class. So that's a number I need for you guys to remember. Okay. Um, let me close out this PowerPoint here. Now, in Schoology, I have uploaded some very important notes for this unit. And these notes uh, begin with describing Newton's three laws of motion. Um, this is something that um, you guys should be familiar with um, and something you guys should have talked about back in middle school. So everyone in here knows Newton's first law, which is also called the law of inertia. And what does the law of inertia state? The law of inertia says that an object at rest stays at rest and an object in motion stays in motion with the same speed in the same direction unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. So basically what that means is if an unbalanced force does not act on a moving object, it will continue in motion at a constant velocity. Um, same thing if an object is at rest. If an unbalanced force does not act on an object at rest, then that object will stay at rest. So, for instance, imagine that I was in space and I had a football in my hand. Uh, because I'm in space and the force of gravity is basically negligible, um, what Newton's first law says is that if I take the, uh, that basketball and I throw it while I'm in space, assuming I had a basketball or some sort of ball in my hand, if I throw that ball, what Newton's first law says is that that, that ball will keep going forever and ever and ever and ever and ever without end. It'll just keep moving, keep traveling at a constant velocity without end, unless, of course, another force decides to act on it that either stops its motion or changes its path of motion. Okay, everybody got that? That's Newton's first law of motion. Okay. What is Newton's second law of motion? Okay. This is Newton's mathematical law. But basically, if I had to give a descrip description of this law, this law says that an the acceleration of an object um, as produced by a net force is directly proportional to the magnitude of the net force in the same direction as the net force and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. Um, in a nutshell, basically what this law is saying is that forces cause objects to accelerate. So in other words, if a force acts on any given mass, that force will cause an object to accelerate. Okay, so if I have to write out this equation in its mathematical form, it will, it will look something like this. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. This is a very, very, very important equation that we're going to use again and again in this course. That if you have an object and you know the mass of the object, and you know the acceleration of the object, then you know the magnitude of the force that produced that acceleration. That's essentially what this equation is saying. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. Um, uh, let me ask you guys a question. Uh, suppose I have um, two balls in each of my hands. Suppose in this hand right here, I had a golf ball, and in this hand right here, I had a bowling ball. So a golf ball and a bowling ball. Someone tell me, if I, if I apply the same magnitude of force to both objects, which one is going to give me the greater acceleration? Okay. 
That should be obvious, guys. If I, so I have a golf ball and I have a bowling ball, and I apply the same magnitude of force to both objects, which one is going to have the greater acceleration? Well, in your everyday experience, it should be obvious that the um, that the golf ball that the golf ball will have the greater acceleration because it's a smaller mass. Um, you know, lighter objects, you know, tend to have a greater acceleration. That's kind of something that you guys should be familiar with um, from your everyday experiences. But of course, what I want to do is I want to, I want to prove that to you guys mathematically. So, um, Let's see if I got any room to write here. Yeah. So if I take this equation here and I rearrange it and I solve for acceleration, basically what I get is acceleration is equal to force divided by mass, right? So, um, so let us compare two objects here. Let us say I have one object that's two kilograms and I have another object that's four kilograms and let us assume that I apply one Newton of force to both objects. So if I apply one Newton of force to the two kilogram mass, so I, to figure out its acceleration, force divided by mass, and I have another mass and I apply one Newton force to the four kilogram mass, which one is going to give me the greater acceleration? By the way, guys, um, I want you guys to be aware of your standard units for force. Force, we always describe in newtons, and mass, we always describe in kilograms. Well, for the most part, we, um, this, I mean, I mean, sometimes you'll see a problem with grams, but for the most part, we use kilograms for our standard unit of mass, and newtons for our standard unit of force. Okay, so guys, um, so let us look at this first object. If I apply a one newton of force, on a two kilogram object, what is its rate of acceleration? One divided by two, that's obviously 0 0.5 meters per second squared. So that's the rate of acceleration for the smaller object. But what about the rate of acceleration for the bigger object? If I apply one Newton force on a four kilogram mass, one divided by four, that's just 0 0.25 meters per second. So notice it should be obvious to you that the smaller mass has a larger acceleration compared to this acceleration here, okay? Because 0.5 is a larger number than 2.25. It's something that I just want you guys to keep in mind. Um, in a moment, I want to show you guys three video clips that describe all of Newton's three laws. You know what? I just realized I, I forgot to mention the third law, motion. Uh, let me go back to share my screen. So um, the third law of motion basically says that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The statement means that in any, in every interaction, there's a pair of forces acting in two, acting on the two interacting objects. The size of the force on the first object equals the size of the force on the second object. So what they're saying is if two objects interact with each other, so let's say you have two people in a room and two people are both pushing on each other. Newton's third law says that the forces that they impute on each other are always equal and opposite. Um, so basically, um, if you push on an object, that option pushes back on you. If I, you know, push on this book, this book is also pushing back on me. That's Newton's third law of motion. And again, we're going to see some videos that describe that. Okay, uh, by the way, before before I get to the videos, there was something I realized that I wanted to say here uh, on this PowerPoint. Let me, I realized there was something I forgot to say, and I want to go ahead and say it just to be sure it's on the video lesson for the day. Um, so remember how I said that all objects accelerate toward the Earth at 9.8 meters per second squared? Um, uh, and guys, um, I, I want to emphasize that is true of all objects independently of the object's mass. So it does not matter um, the size of the object. You have you can have an object as big as a piano, or you have an object as small as a bowling ball. 
um, um, or a golf ball or, you know, even a basketball, all of those objects will accelerate <clears throat> at the exact same rate toward the earth in the absence of air resistance. I want to make that point pretty clear. In the absence of air resistance. And uh, the reason why I want to make that point, because some of you guys may be wondering, well, Mr. Taylor, if you take a sheet of paper, if you take a sheet of paper and you drop it, you know, it's going to appear to accelerate at a smaller rate um, compared to, let's say, a bowling ball. Um, and you guys would be right. And the reason why that is is because uh, if I drop the sheet of paper, there's air in the room here, and those air currents kind of, you know, act to resist the motion of the paper. Uh, but the point is, if I if I can suck all the air out of, suck all of the air out of this room and drop this sheet of paper, it would accelerate at the exact same rate as the bowling ball. Um, just something I want you guys to keep in mind because uh, that's an important point that you guys need to know as we go throughout this course is that all objects in gravitational fields accelerate at the exact same rate here on Earth in the absence of air resistance. Okay. Now, let us move to these videos that I want to show you guys. And then we're going to, so we're going to watch the three video clips and then we're going to close the day working, out on, working on a few examples. Okay. Texas area homeowners, if you have a power meter like this on the side of your house, you can get paid to go solar for no money. Okay, now um, these videos are um, relatively short. The first one is the longest video, which is going to be about five minutes. Um, and the other two were really, you know, really short, like two to three minutes. Uh, but this first video here describes Newton's first law of motion. Um, and guys, uh, pay attention to this video because some of the points in this video here will be asked on your Ed Puzzle assignment later on today. Because um, there's a there, uh, there will be an Ed Puzzle assignment that I that I'm going to post as soon as class is over, which will involve you answering questions um, from that video and also you know general points made in this video as well. Okay, let me share my sound with you guys so you guys can hear it. And guys, uh, these videos, basically, most of, most of these videos, um, or I should say most, uh, um, most of the concepts in this video are taken from uh, situations that were, um, that involved the astronaut or something being in space. Because when, when you're in space, gravity is negligible, and that sort of gives you an idea of understanding how Newton's laws work in their fullest sense. So let me go ahead and play this video. But Newton's is the robot to the European. Welcome to the European Space Agency, ESA. This is the Robotic Learning Centre, and I'm here to help you find out more about Newton's Three Laws of Motion. Maybe you've heard of Newton before. He is the scientist who got hit on the head with an apple. At that time, he was studying motion, trying to understand the concepts behind it and how they relate to things we experience in everyday life. When Newton recovered, he realised something important. He already knew that an object accelerates only when a force acts on it. Therefore, if the apple were moving, it could only accelerate if there was a force acting on it. He called this force gravity, and to this day we measure all forces, including gravity, in Newtons. Newton came up with three laws of motion, laws that describe how forces and objects relate to each other. To help you out, I've asked some friends in Barcelona, Dublin and Erlangen to demonstrate the laws. I've also asked astronauts on board the International Space Station to help us. That's the ISS for short. So we're going to hear from Pedro Duque and Alexander Caleri. On board the ISS, gravity has very little effect, so everything there is almost weightless. Hi 
Hi, Pedro. That's a nice smile you've got there, Pedro. Not much is happening. The ball is just hanging there in midair. Pedro blows on it and it moves because of the force of his breath. Now the ball is moving again, except this time Alexander has stopped it with his hand. And this time, nice move. Pedro changes the ball's direction by applying a force. What you've been seeing are illustrations of Newton's first law of motion. This states that every object in motion or at rest remains in that state unless an unbalanced force is applied to it. The state of motion is the speed and also the direction. The two combined, speed and direction, are what we call velocity. An object at rest has a velocity of zero and it stays at rest unless acted on by a force. We call this tendency inertia. Here you can see Pedro applying a force to the ball. He is changing the ball's direction, therefore changing its velocity. In the second experiment, you see Alexander stopping the ball. Here he's changing the speed, therefore he's changing its velocity. The rate of change of velocity is called acceleration. Let's see what our schools have to show us. Pushing the skateboard, that's a force, isn't it? The skateboard moves, hits the pillar and changes direction. But the apple keeps going. That's because this time the force is only applied to the skateboard and not the apple. That's why eating in space isn't easy. The spoon stops, but the food keeps going. Ooh, that looks nasty. And that's why we use seatbelts. If we were in a weightless environment like the ISS, then he would continue to move. But on Earth, gravity pulls him back down. Okay, here we go again. That looks really messy. That's why we have to use lids on takeaway coffee. Thanks, girls. Good trick. I'm sure I don't have to say, don't try this at home. Looks like she's getting her teacher in to help. That apple's not going anywhere. I mentioned objects at rest, didn't I? In these experiments, the apple, the pencil, and the girl on rollerblades are not moving. They're at rest because the forces acting on them are in balance with each other. But when the support is removed, the force of gravity, now unbalanced, pulls them to the ground. Without the force of gravity, they would just stay afloat. Just like on board the ISS. So, that's Newton's first law. An object at rest stays at rest unless acted on by a force. And an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted on by a force. Okay, guys, we're going to stop there for the first video. So um, um, those were several good examples of Newton's first law at work. Um, now let us move on to the second law of motion. Hello everyone, I'm astronaut Randy Bresnik, living and working aboard the International Space Station. Now, on the space station, we live in a microgravity environment. Do you think the laws of physics will hold up? Come on, let's go find out.
The acceleration of an object depends on the net force acting on the object and the mass of the object, or F equals MA. Surely good show, Sir Isaac. Here we see that once the force of the thrust is greater than the weight of the vehicle, the rocket begins to accelerate. All right, we're going to start with something small, something you might have at home, a little stick of chapstick. We'll go ahead and use our force being our bungee cord here. We'll put it on our bungee, and we'll pull it back. And you can see how fast it accelerates because there's very little mass. Next, we'll try a little spaceship. A little more massive, and you can feel that because as you move it, you can feel that the, the kind of the force, the extra force you have to push with your hand. So we'll put our spaceship on our launcher here. Same spot. Notice it's flying a lot slower than that chapstick did. What we've seen is the same amount of force on a smaller, less massive object means acceleration is faster. Well, this is the biggest and most massive thing we have. So let's see how the acceleration is affected. Pull back the same amount on the force, and here we go. And there you have it. Newton's second law of motion in action. Thanks everybody for exploring a little physics with me today. Now I'm going to send it back to Earth so you can start your experiments. See. Okay, so um, guys, that's Newton's um, second law. And notice an important point that he made that I also made um, earlier during this lecture. Notice how he said the smaller mass. So um, when he had the chapstick, um, when when he had the chapstick here. Um, basically, the smaller mass gave the greater acceleration when basically the, the force of the cord um, acted on it. So there we have the large acceleration. And if we have an even bigger object, um, we had a smaller acceleration. And, and if you guys watch the screen, you will notice that, that this acceleration here of this object that he's holding uh, will be smaller than the acceleration of the chapstick. So that's the key point that I want you guys to... Um, note about Newton's second law. And also one thing that I want to say about this video, um, there's a term that he used that I that you know a lot of physicists don't like whenever um, referring to acceleration. Notice how he said faster acceleration. Guys, physicists don't like to use the term faster to refer to acceleration. Uh, they prefer to say greater acceleration. So whenever you guys talk about acceleration, either say greater or smaller, um, we tend to use the term faster and slower whenever we're talking about velocity. Like, so whenever we're talking about speed and velocity, that's when you want to say faster or slower. Um, but whenever you talk about acceleration, um, don't use those terms. Either say greater acceleration or smaller acceleration. Just something that I just wanted to throw out there because he, you know, was just, you know, something that he said that kind of bugged me. Uh, because again, acceleration, we tend to say greater acceleration and smaller acceleration. Okay, one more video. And that is the video on Newton's three, on Newton's third law. Welcome to the International Space Station. I'm NASA astronaut Mark Vandehei. Today, we're going to talk about Newton's third law. How do you think it will hold up in microgravity? For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. This means that in every interaction between two objects, there are a pair of opposite forces acting on each object at the same time, a force pair. You can see that there are many examples on Earth. In space, thrusters expel one way and the vehicle is steered in the opposite way. Hello again, more basketball stunts that I can't do on the ground, at least not while getting this much hang time. <laughs> All right, back to serious business. We've got a basketball right here. It's gonna be object one. I'm the second object. If object two, myself, applies a uh, force to object one, then that same force will be applied according to Newton's third law 
by object one onto object two. However, there's a big disparity in the mass. Object one is a very light mass object. Object two, myself, is, is a larger mass object. So I'm going to try to make myself about the same shape as this ball. See how that works for us. And I'm going to apply that force. You saw that force applied to the ball made it accelerate quite a bit. It really didn't accelerate me much at all. Newton's third law again, but this time we're going to use two similarly massed objects. Joe and I have about the same mass. So Joe, get into a ball. I'll do the same. I'm going to face you this way so that I don't throw you into something you can't see. Now I'm going to get into a ball behind Joe, and I'm going to apply a force to him. Notice that the, when I applied a force to Joe, it, pushed, it accelerated Joe away from me, but I got accelerated away from him as well because the force applied to Joe ended up being the same force that was applied to me. Now you've seen Newton's third law in space. Now test it out on Earth. Okay, so that was Newton's three laws. So uh, you guys clearly saw that as he pushed, um, um, as he pushed on his volunteer here, you guys clearly, clearly see that when he pushed on his volunteer, the volunteer pushed right back at him, right? There was an um, equal and opposite reaction. In other words, the, the, the force, the same force that was applied in this direction was exactly equivalent to the magnitude of the force that was applied in the opposite direction. Um, now, I want to say this here, going back, I'm making an important point here. The same is also true for the basketball. Um, when he pushed on the basketball, and one, uh, one of the things he said, when he push, when he pushes on the basketball, it is true that the same magnitude of the force applied to the basketball is equivalent to the same magnitude of the force acting from the basketball on him. The only difference is because the basketball is a smaller mass, it's going to have a greater acceleration. But the key point is the magnitude of those forces are still the same. Um, and we see that, you know, you know, because there was some force acting on him, he did accelerate a little bit in the opposite direction. So, Newton's third law. In the last 10 minutes of class, what I want to do with you guys, I want to work out a few examples of Newton's second law um, that you could see um, on your homework in the coming days. So, let me get... Get ready to pull up that on my screen. Let me close these videos. You guys, give me just a second while I pull up this file. So we're going to close today just basically doing four problems, four mathematical problems that involve Newton's second law. Um, and we've already said what Newton's second law is. Newton's second law is force is equal to mass times acceleration. And guys, um, whenever you are working out these problems, always, always put your correct units for your answer. Force is always in Newtons. Mass is in kilograms. And acceleration, we already know, is meters per second squared. So always put your units here at the end of these problems. Number one says, let me make this bigger so I can write on this. Number one says, how much force is needed to accelerate a truck with a mass of 1,500 kilograms at a rate of 2 meters per second squared? Okay. So in order to do this problem, let us first write down Newton's second law which says force is equal to mass times acceleration, okay? And in this problem here, we are dealing with a truck. So we're dealing with a pretty big mass. So the mass here is 1,500 kilograms. And the, we're told that the rate of acceleration of this truck was 2 meters per second squared. Okay. 
So guys, if the, the rate of acceleration is 2 meters per second squared, how much force was needed to accelerate the truck at this rate? Well, you just do the math. 1,500 times 2 gives you a magnitude of a force of 3,000 newtons. So there you go. That's how you do number one. Okay. Now let's keep going. Number two says, what is the mass of an object that requires 10 newtons of force to accelerate it at a rate of one meter per second squared? Okay, so, um, first thing first, I want to write down Newton's second law here. We know that Newton's second law says that force is equal to mass times acceleration. Okay. But I want you guys to notice what we're solving for. Um, the question asks us, what is the mass of the object? So we're solving for m here. Guys, just using basic algebra, you guys should know in order to get m by itself, basically I have to divide the right-hand side of my equation by acceleration. Okay. That's right. Um, division is the opposite of multiplication. When I do that, the acceleration goes away. And whatever to the one side, I have to do to the other. So therefore, I'm just left with force divided by acceleration is equal to my object's mass. So this is the equation I'm using to solve for m. Okay. So now let's just plug everything in. We're told that the force required was 10 newtons. So I'm going to plug in 10 newtons for my force. And we're, we're also told that the rate of acceleration was one meter per second squared. So if I plug in one meter per second for my force, so force divided by acceleration basically gives me 10 divided by one, which is exactly equal to 10 kilograms. So here is the mass of our object for number two. Any questions? Does that make sense? All right, number three. Number three says, what is the acceleration of a 2,000 kilogram truck if a force of three newtons is used to make it start moving forward? Okay. So what is the rate of acceleration of a 2,000 kilogram truck yeah, if the force is 3,000 newtons? Okay, so let me, so, um, let me write down um, Newton's second law again, which says force is equal to mass times acceleration. Okay. Now, guys, since we're solving for acceleration, basically, we, we want to get A by itself on the right-hand side of the equation. So if I do that, I'm going to need to divide this by mass, right, because I have to do the opposite of multiplication to get rid of that. That goes away. And whatever I do to one side of my equation, I have to do to the other. So force divided by mass clearly gives me acceleration. Okay. So acceleration in this case uh, is equal to force divided by mass. So my force is 3,000 newtons. So our force is 3,000 newtons. And our mass is 2,000 kilograms. If you put that in your calculator, 3,000 divided by 2,000 gives you 1.5 meters per second squared for the magnitude of the acceleration, or in other words, the rate of acceleration of the truck. Any questions on number three? Okay, let's keep going. Last one here. Number four says, what is the weight of a one kilogram apple? Okay. Ah, weight. So this is the first time that we're using this term here in physics. Um, in terms of how physicists define weight, what exactly is weight? Well, you guys all know that if you're at home and you want to know your weight, all you have to do is stand on a scale, okay? Um, and the scale tells you your weight. But what exactly is the scale weighting? 
reading. It turns out, guys, the scale reads the magnitude of the force of gravity pulling down on you, right? Because gravity is what's pulling you down to the earth and is keeping you secure to the earth. So the weight itself, um, um, the scale, the scale actually weighs the force of gravity. So an important point that I need to know in this class is that um, anytime, anytime you're asked to solve for the force of gravity, you guys need to know that the force of gravity, I'm sorry, let me restate that. Anytime you're asked to solve for an object's weight, you guys need to know that the force of gravity is equivalent to the object's weight. Okay, so weight equals the force of gravity. Um, and again, I'm going to say this again, whenever you guys are standing on a scale, um, the scale is literally measuring the force of gravity acting on you. So force of gravity is equivalent to weight. Uh, now, um, how can we calculate the force of gravity? Uh, well, that's going to require some information that I gave you guys earlier. Um, but before I calculate the magnitude of the force of gra gravity acting on this 0.1 kilogram apple, I want to write down Newton's second law. Newton's second law says that force is equal to mass times acceleration, right? Okay. But notice here, we are specifically talking about the force of gravity. Not just any force, but the force of gravity. So guys, remember what I said at the beginning of this lecture. Anything falling toward the Earth has an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared um, as a result of gravity acting on it. So the acceleration of gravity is 9.8. So that means the equation for the force of gravity is equal to mass times its acceleration, which is 9.8. So that means if I want to find the force of gravity acting on a 0.1 kilogram apple that is basically sitting still, um, I will need to plug in 0.1 into this equation times 9.8. And when I do that, 0.1 times 9.8, I get a magnitude for my force of gravity acting on my apple to be 0.98 newtons. Okay. And of course, remember what I said earlier, if you know the force of gravity, then you know the object's weight because force of gravity equals weight. That's what the scale measures. It measures the force of gravity acting on you. So... To answer my original question, the weight of the apple is 0.98 newtons. Okay. Now, um, one more thing I want to say here before I let you guys go. Um, you guys are probably probably used to seeing um, um, weight being described in pounds. And yes, it is true that mostly in our everyday lives, we tend to define weight in pounds, but physicists tend to, defi tend, to fi tend to define weight in newtons. And yes, there is a way to convert between newtons and pounds and vice versa if you wanted to do that. But in this class, we typically define weight in newtons. Um, just something to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, any questions on these examples? Okay, hey, guys, there will be an Ed Puzzle video um, that I'm going to post for you guys to complete. Um, keep that in mind. Um, if there are no immediate questions for me, you guys are free to go. And I hope you guys have a good day and good luck on your Ed Puzzle assignment, which I'm going to post as soon as I close out this section. This session. Have a good one, everyone.